Hello, fellow hopers, family, friends, and hope revolutionaries. It's Marisol. Welcome to the Seven Days of Hope. I'm part of a wonderful hope team. We've been working hard with Trina behind the scenes, and we hope you have a wonderful time tonight. We're so, or today, it could be today, depending on where you are in the world, right? But we're so happy that you've joined us. Thank you for trusting us with this time together. Before we go on to our live presentation, and I'm sorry, you might have to put up with this few minutes every night, but I want to bring us into state. I want us to all just take a moment to just relax our bodies and stand still and just acknowledge however we feel. However we feel, just acknowledge that. And then let's take a deep breath, just a deep inhale. But when we take that breath, let it be the breath of hope. So let's take that breath together. And we're going to hold for three. One, two, three. And we're going to release whatever cares, whatever things we need to let go. We're just going to release it as we exhale that breath. And we're going to do it two more times. We're going to inhale that breath of hope. And we're going to hold it for one, two, three. And on the exhale, we're going to just release whatever we need to release and let go, whatever we need to let go. And one more time, breathe in that breath of hope. And breathe out whatever we have to release. And when you're ready to get back into the room, we are ready for you. Welcome and enjoy the seven days of hope. Today we're reading chapter two. What happened in chapter one is that we had a little teeny caterpillar being born from an egg named Stripe. And he ate and ate and ate until he got so big that he decided there must be more to life than that. And he went down the tree where he looked around and found a lot of other things. He saw insects and caterpillars, and he was wondering what was there and where they were going and what was the meaning of life, and nothing seemed to answer anything. And then he and the other caterpillars saw this big pile at a distance. And when they got closer, they saw it was a pile of squirming caterpillars, so high that it was reaching the top in the clouds. And all these other caterpillars were rushing to go there. So Stripe thought it must be right because everybody was trying to go there. So he too jumped in. Now that's where we're starting chapter two. You see what a mess it is. The first moments on the pile were a shock. Stripe was pushed and kicked and stepped on from every direction. It was climb or be climbed. Stripe climbed. No more fellow caterpillars on Stripe's pile. They became only threats and obstacles, which he turned into steps and opportunities. This single-minded approach really helped, and Stripe felt he was getting much higher. But some days, it seemed he could manage only to keep his place. It was especially then that an anxious shadow nagged inside. What's at the top, it whispered. Where are we going? On one exasperated day, Stripe couldn't stand it any longer and actually yelled back. I don't know, but there's no time to think about it. A little yellow caterpillar he was crawling over gasped. What did you say? I was just talking to myself, Stripe muttered. It really isn't important. I was just wondering where we're going. You know, Yellow said, I was wondering that myself. But since there's no way to find out, I decided it wasn't important. She blushed at how silly this sounded, quickly adding, No one else seems to worry about where we're going, so it must be good. 
But she blushed again. How far are we from the top? Stripe answered gravely. Since we're not at the bottom and not at the top, we must be in the middle. Oh, said Yellow. And they both began climbing again. But now Stripe had a new feeling. He felt bad. He had lost his single-mindedness. How can I step on someone I've just talked to? Stripe avoided yellow as much as possible. But one day, there she was, blocking the only way up. Well, I guess it's you or me, he said, and stepped squarely on her head. Something in the way Yellow looked at him made him feel just awful about himself. Like no matter what is up there, it just isn't worth it. Stripe called off Yellow and whispered, I'm sorry. And Yellow began to cry. I could stand this life hoping in what was up ahead until I met you talking to yourself that day. Since then, my heart just hasn't been in it. But I don't know what to do. I didn't know how badly I felt about this life until then. Now, when you look at me so kindly, I know for sure I don't like this life. I just want to do something like crawl with you and nibble grass. Stripe's heart leapt inside. Everything looked different. The pillar made no sense at all. I would like that too, he whispered. But this meant giving up the climb. A hard decision. Yellow deer, maybe we're close to the top. Maybe if we help each other, we can get there quickly. Maybe, she said. But they both knew this wasn't what they wanted most. Let's go down, Yellow said. Okay. And they stopped climbing. The air was terrible, but they were happy with each other and made a big ball so nobody could step in their eyes and stomachs. They did nothing at all for what seemed a long time. Suddenly, they didn't feel anything crawling over them. They unrolled and opened their eyes. They were at the side of the caterpillar pillar. Hi, Stripe, said Yellow. Hi, Yellow said Stripe, and they crawled off into some fresh green grass to eat and take a nap. Just before they fell asleep, Stripe hugged Yellow. Being together like this is sure different from being crushed in that crowd. It sure is. She smiled and closed her eyes. That's the end of chapter two. Hello and welcome to Seven Days of Hope. This is day number two, chapter two. My name is Scott. I'm a team member of the Hope for the Flowers team. And I'd like to introduce you to Mary Saul, who is also a member of the team. Mary Saul. 
Hi, everybody, and welcome. So, so glad you're here. What a beautiful reading. And the music, <laughs> just, just wonderful. We are so grateful that you plan to join us for this time. And there's been so much happening and in this world that Trina just wanted to bring hope. And I am so privileged and so blessed to be a part of it. And to be a part of this night where we have some incredible guests along with Trina. So Trina, you wanna say hello real quick before I throw it back to you? <laughs> and we also have... Oh. Um. And we have Denise Patrick with us Hi. and Gail Boss. And these are incredible female authors. And tonight we have a powerhouse of authors that are women that have just really made an impact on this world. So here, without further ado, Trina, I'm going to hand it over to you. Trina, unmute yourself, please. Okay, go ahead. You're in, unmuted, uh, Trina, so go ahead, please. We're all learning. I had muted myself and forgot to unmute you. So anybody who's on Zoom these days or learning it is likely to do the same, make the mistake. And, and we made a lot last night, and I hope we'll make fewer th tonight. So last night was on technology, and I figured that the mistakes are all part of learning, and so it's good for everybody who's trying to do this for the first time to see us make mistakes because we have some people who know lots more than I do. My beautiful team of Marisol and Scott are much more into this world than I am. And we have another one behind the scenes, Sam, who is making a beautiful new website that we'll be able to see soon. So I think what's important and grateful Marisol that you put us into that frame of it of being quiet to start with, because we are doing this where we try to look for the signs of hope and of what we can do during this worldwide global equal equalizer, in a sense, of the pandemic. Not quite equal. The poor are always going to suffer more than those who aren't. The people who are out there in the service worlds taking care of the rest of us are going to suffer more. But we're in this together in a way that it's hard to imagine. And what's going to happen as this clears? What's going to happen? I hope we don't go back to the unequal and, and way that when we were before and that we use this for changing our world in a positive direction. And that's why the image of the caterpillar changing so radically to a butterfly has always inspired me. It is the revolution of the spirit and the world that can not be complexual, but profound. So very true, Gina. That is beautifully said, beautifully said. Um, I'd love to know what uh, the people in the chat thought about this chapter. If there's any kind of story or something that it sparked in you that you want to share, please feel free. We always love to hear from you. Um, and Denise and Gail, please feel free to share your take on what Trina just read. And I have to introduce them a little bit better. Oh, uh, yes. I was, no, I think I have to say I, that's fine. Why, that's why you're collecting your chats from the people who have now been invited to the chat. Or did you want to say something about the rules of the game, Harry Soul? No, no, no. It's okay, Trina. We're going to go with the flow, and I'm going to I'm going to keep it back on your your court then. Okay, I've known Denise Patrick for some time and I've admired all her work, which has mostly been for young people. And now she's into young people that are a bit older. So that's what we're going to focus tonight on. And this is her book. I'll probably hold it up again. I hope the light shines correctly on it. Finding some place. You'll know what, more about it when she gets to speak about it. 
But Denise is a very prolific professional writer. I've always felt a little bit uh, guilty that my book has done so well, and I've only done one book. And Gail and Denise has done many books. Was that 24, Denise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Okay. And Gail is a sort of, what, yes, were you going to say something? No, I just said something like that, yes. Something like that. <laughs> and Gail, I fell in love with her book, All Creation Waits, a couple of years ago. And it's about the animals going through the winter. And the first story in it was about a turtle that almost dies every winter and gives up all the calcium and all the bones and everything to just live and exist through the winter. And all of these ordinary animals, well, at least in my part of the world, they're fairly ordinary. The foxes, the possums, uh, the squirrels, how they get through the winter. I never knew it was so difficult. So I love that book so much. I bought several boxes of it and gave it away as my Christmas present when it first came out, Gail. So yes. I was thrilled with it. Now she's with her next book called Wild Hope. And she'll, I think when she speaks, she'll hold up the covers of that so you can see it. And uh, so she's writing now about extinction. Mm-hmm. And will tell us much more about that. So I think that's as much as I need to say right now. If we want to go to this part of the book is the part where they are more innocently climbing the pillar because it looks like the way to go. Mm-hmm. And most of us have innocently climbed in the one or more or many pillars in our lives because it looked like the way to go. So it's true. How many of us follow the crowd? So many of us, right? We see the crowd is going that way. Hey, there must be something good there. Let's go, you know, and now, you know, all of a sudden something will snap and things look very different. And where you think you're going, you suddenly end up making that U-turn or going in a different direction. I know a lot of you can relate to that. Yeah. And one of the things that we were thinking about Oh, let me put myself on. Sorry. One of the things that we were thinking about was that during this period of transition right now, it's pretty serious, and I don't want to diminish it, but it might be just the sort of wake-up call that we've been looking for or that is needed in order to get from where we were and the way we thought things had to be to something new. Because if, if we're not immune to... Uh, you know, the coronavirus, then what else is it that we should be paying attention to that we might not be immune to as well? So all of this is uh, fodder for discussion uh, on the second day of Seven Days of Hope. I I think it it seems like it's also uh, this chapter is about recognizing what you really in your heart need to live your best life. And they, when they meet each other, discover about themselves and each other, that they don't really not just want what is up at the top of the pillar, but they need something different to sustain themselves um, in a really good way. And, And that's kind of what I was thinking as Trina was reading. It's about that discovery of what you need in life as opposed to what you think you want in life. I was touched at that moment where the two caterpillars roll off the pillar, but then they have to just wait together. And there is for them and for us, before we can change directions and do something new, as individuals, as families, as communities, as a nation, maybe, I think there's that necessary waiting time before the new direction is revealed. And Mm -hmm. that feels scary. It feels like nothing. Yeah. Wait, uh, that was my first book, right? All creation waits. I guess waiting is a theme for me. Yeah. We have to wait. Yeah. yeah. We'll get more waiting as the book goes on and more climbing. And uh, one of my new friends said that she reminds her husband at certain points, go down to the meadow. And she, and she said to me the other day, she says, but the word meadow isn't in the book any place. And, but the idea is the same. To mm. go down to, so that was her idea, to, what you just said, Gail, to go down to the meadow and, uh, and wait there a while. So, mm-hmm. so um, 
So one of the things I'm wondering about is, within the context of what we've been talking about is what is the role of self-knowledge maturing, but uh, more importantly, self-knowledge in this journey, do you think? Knowing yourself. Go for it. I, I mean, I, I think it's crucial, um, but I also think it kind of uh, connecting with uh, Gail's idea of waiting, that self-knowledge is not something that you can achieve without the experience of, of life. And, and therein is the waiting to have enough life experience and different life experiences to, to be able to even understand uh, oneself. Um, so th those things kind of go together, I, I, I think. Uh, we have Laura here that says, it's okay to change paths and reflect before continuing. Mm -hmm. So true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm gonna butcher Father Richard Rohr's quote terribly, but he says something like, uh, we don't change our way of living by changing the way we think. We change the way we think by changing the way we live. It, yes. You just gotta do it. Uh, I mean, that doesn't contra contradict waiting, but um, we live into change mm -hmm. uh, rather than we figure it out first and then mm -hmm. do it. That's kind of what you were saying, Denise? Yes, yes, totally, totally. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that. And that, that is in the experience of, of living. Yeah. yeah. And, and so they wait, right? Because they don't know. They just have to, there's no knowledge to drive them forward. They have to just be still for a few minutes and then be moved by something else. I don't know what that, maybe that's what you were asking, Scott. I don't know what that impetus is that moves us on. It's not a new thought. It's a, it's a motivation of the spirit yeah, that moves us to the next place. I noticed that they have each other too. That's important, that they have each other in the waiting and in the moving. Yeah. So what, what I was thinking is at the very beginning of the book, uh, they, they don't know themselves. Well, Stripe especially doesn't know himself, but um, Yellow is also finding her way. And as they gained more experience and as they uh, uh, applied it uh, to what was inside them, uh, they each followed, you know, followed their own pathway. And um, as they got to know themselves better, they were able to make different decisions. Or, on the other hand, not knowing yourself. So it was just an earlier comment that someone had made that uh, prompted my original question. Well, we have someone that wants to know, how does Yellow maintain her super free-spirited and sweet personality through this all? <laughs> Well, Trina, yeah. maybe you're the one to answer that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know because she does it, but I don't know that we're quite there with this chapter. <laughs> in other words, people have to tune in tomorrow or the next day? Yeah, she, she really does do this. She's one of the most beautiful. That was the question, and she is. And I think. Um... What do you say? Excuse me, Mary Soul. Okay, this is one of the issues of um, Zoom. Here we go. We, we, we meet people who are so free-spirited and different. Um, and then we meet other people who, you know, you see the half glass full or the half glass empty. What, what makes the difference between us? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a question. You know, sometimes in the same family, raised exactly the same way, but completely <laughs> different personalities. But I... I, I mean, I've learned, and I'll just say this from, from mother experience, which, which not everyone has, but everyone is coming into the world. We come into the world with who we are. And like you said, you may be part of a particular kind of family, but you are you as an individual. My father used to always say um, that we are unique. And that was from when I was a kid before I really understand, understood what that meant. And, and I think that in, in Yellow's not giving away what's happening later, but just in looking at kids and looking at kids I've you know met when I visited schools, my own kids, now grandkids, and how individual these small people are from the very beginning. And it's, it's fascinating to, to watch that. And, and as you say, uh, Scott, see what happens. Hopefully I will see her 
develop into who she will become and get a little bit of that self-knowledge. I, you know, I don't know, but it'd be great. You just had a new grandchild. Uh, yeah, well, well, one is two years old and the other one is only one month old, so. Yes. During the coronavirus time. Yay for new grandkids. I'm going to have one born in June during this coronavirus. Yes, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, Gail, I would love to hear more about what you are doing, and especially Wild Hope. Um, I actually met Gail on one of her webinars mm -hmm. um, and heard about Wild Hope through Trina. And Trina and I got on the webinar, and it was absolutely amazing. So I am so, so, so overjoyed that she was able to join us here today. So Gail, I'm going to pass it over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, as Trina mentioned, my new book just released this year for Lent is called Wild Hope Stories for Lent from the Vanishing. The Vanishing in this case, as you might intuit from the cover, this is a North Atlantic right whale. The Vanishing in this case are species that we're apt to lose from the planet if we don't radically change the way we live. For the season of Lent, there are 25 stories of 25 animals that are drastically endangered, like the North Atlantic right whale. There are about 400 of these great creatures left in the oceans. And I try to tell in this book stories of particular individuals. Um, I believe, as I know Denise does, that stories of particular people can help illuminate for us a big picture, a big crisis, that we learn about a situation by learning about how specific people in that crisis react. In this case, specific animals in a specific species and what's happening to them. My hope was really to break people's hearts, to melt their hearts in this Lenten springtime, to thaw them into a greater compassion for these creatures that, as Meister Eckhart says, are expressions of God, and including expressions of God's own suffering. What a better subject for Lent, yes, the, the suffering of God's beauty. Um, so that's what this book is all about. 25 different animals that I see as expressions of God's own self, God's own suffering, um, trying to, to show us uh, who they are in this world and, and how, how we lean on them for an understanding of ourselves so that we will thaw in compassion and make the radical changes in our lives that are necessary to save them and ourselves, all we animals, are in this together. We were speaking earlier today about how the COVID pandemic has told us how much we are all in this together and not just humans, but how all we animals are in this pandemic together. If any of you have read or heard the news, you know that COVID-19 leapt into the human population when a bat that was infected, infected a pangolin which is one of the animals in Wild Hope, a Chinese pangolin. And that pangolin was illegally hunted, illegally trafficked and illegally sold in a wild animal market in China. And the person who bought it was infected and then it rippled out and here we are with more than 10,000 deaths now in the state of New York. So we are all in this together, including all we animals. Um, that's what I'm about right now. So, so Gail, you, you've been monitoring uh, people's opinions about um, endangered species. Uh, you have the picture of the pangolin. You had the picture just a little bit ago. Do you know where it Did is? Did I? Is, is this? Uh, I don't think so. Is this what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that is it. That's, that's it. the story. Of the, that's the picture of the Chinese pangolin, the illustration that accompanies the story in the book. And Gail, is that a little baby pangolin that rides on them? On the pangolin? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, the mother pangolin puts the baby on her tail, or rather the baby jumps onto her tail, and that's how he is carried about while she's doing her hunting at night, while she's burrowing into her burrow for the sleep during the day, and then when he's illegally hunted and when she is Ill illegally hunted and pulled out of her burrow, she will drop that baby down under her belly and ball around it like a like a ball. And those scales that you can see on the pangolin are so thick and so tough that not even a tiger's fangs can pierce them. 
So she protects that baby by balling up around it in an impenetrable ball. Mm. So how big are these? Oh, Trina, now I did the research for this so long ago, I don't recall, but, and they're different sizes, the different kinds of pangolins. There's a Chinese pangolin, there's another Indian pangolin, there are four different kinds, I believe, of African pangolin, but I believe this one, the Chinese one, is about two feet from tip of the nose to the tail. About two feet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is this a time for you to read your hopeful story? Yeah, I will say that, so there's stories for Lent, are stories that are um, dark. They're heavy, they're hard to read. They're about the, the great imperilment feature, uh, facing these creatures and how, as I said, we may lose them, uh, 400 North Atlantic right whales, and many people expect their extinction within the next 50 years if things don't drastically change. I will say that within each story, there is also the story of a specific person or persons who are devoting their lives out of love to saving these creatures, and in many cases are giving them hope. But the story for Easter, because that's our resurrection day in the Christian tradition, the story given for Easter Day is a story about a species that actually has come back from the dead. It is a resurrection story of a species. That species is called the Taki. Here's the illustration in the book. Some of you may know the this, this species that I'm calling Taki, and you'll understand why when I read the story, as Shabalski's horse. And I'll explain in this story, too, why it is also called Shabalski's horse. So here it is, the story for Easter Sunday called Taki. It's a, a bit long. It's almost seven minutes. So I invite you, if you'd like, if you listen better that way, to close your eyes as you listen and try to, try to picture these remarkable horses. The last wild one vanished from human sight in 1969. Mongolian herders saw him like a mirage far off in the yellow hills. And then they didn't. Though to Western science, his kind didn't even exist until 1878, the nomads knew him as ancient and immortal. He was untamable, progenitor of the horses that made their lives possible. Science named his species after the man who delivered a skull and hide for analysis, Shabalski's horse. To the Mongolians living at the edges of his realm, he and his kind had always been Taki, spirit. In a land of extremes, herds of Taki thrive for tens of thousands of years. Perhaps because the nomads believed them immortal, they drove ever larger flocks of sheep and goats into the spirit horse grasslands. When Europeans and Americans got loose of the only horses never tamed for human use, they wanted them. Expeditions captured Taki poles by shooting the uncapturable stallions and mares. Held in circuses and zoos, Taki Young died. In the end, 12 survived. The last free Taki had vanished when a 19-year-old Swiss woman saw wild horses painted on the walls of caves in southwestern France. Their haunting beauty, stroked on stone by prehistoric artists, touched her, as did her realization that all the animals Oryx, Ibex, bison, bears, leaping among the horses had disappeared from that landscape. She went to see Taki enclosed in a zoo. Her sadness seeded a dream. 15 years earlier, in the mid-1950s, a few conservationists had decided to devote themselves to the last captives. They began a careful breeding program, which the 12 surviving in the Munich and Prague zoos, with the 12 surviving in the Munich and Prague zoos. Encircled in their attentiveness, the Taki multiplied and multiplied. 
By the early 1990s, zoos and parks in 33 countries tended 1,500 horses. At that moment, the Swiss woman was ready. Since seeing them painted on cave walls and penned in a zoo, she had given herself to wild horses, learning everything known about them. In 1993, she selected six stallions and five mares born in the captive breeding program and brought them to a protected plateau in the south of France, land that echoed their ancestral home. Though experts warned against it, she released the zoo raised animals to run freely and form their own societies. Some had never grazed grass. A decade later, the little band of 11 had swelled to 55 horses that remembered who they were. Aggression among them had ebbed. Stallions no longer killed bulls. It was time to begin taking the Taki home. 12 were coaxed into small crates. In the hold of a cargo plane, the woman and her team sat among the crates for the 45 hour flight, feeding the animals apples and hay, singing and telling them stories. When they landed on the remote steppe in Western Mongolia, a crowd of herding people met them. Some who remembered spirit horses from their childhoods had ridden their tamed horses more than a hundred miles to see Taki again. Most rode to see them for the first time. The crates were lined up on the windswept step. Smelling the wild, the horses neighed and pawed the wooden floors. Elders poured a blessing of mare's milk over each impatient captive. Then, in unison, men perched on the top of each crate lifted slats that set the taki free. Above the sound of hooves pounding away from them, men, women, and children clapped and cheered and wept. Thank you, they said, thank you. Other Taki lovers have brought horses home to two more places in the Mongolian wilderness. Across the border, Chinese conservationists protect a herd, as do Ukrainians, Kazakhs, and Russians on expanses of steppe they fought wars to call their own. Across their ancient homelands, as many as 2,000 Taki now run free and live wild lives. A herd flourishes in the 1,000 square mile Chernobyl exclusion zone, evacuated and declared a dead zone after a nuclear reactor exploded in 1986. Once extinct in the wild, Taki are now designated simply endangered. This is good, but it's only the beginning, the Taki woman says of her dream. We want not just to bring Taki home, we want them to live on for six million years. Golden lion tamarins and brown pelicans, bald eagles and peregrine falcons, red wolves, gray wolves, Florida panthers, California condors and Vancouver Island marmots, the nene, the bontabok, the attics, American berry beetles and American alligators, yellowfin mad toms, piping plovers, all these species and more once seemed certain to vanish from the earth. And all have returned, some astoundingly, some haltingly, because humans, many or few, allowed a wild hope to bloom. In such as these, a dream seated in sadness and love, quietly defies cynicism and grows by turning fear into work. Their dream work is daily, tedious, and life-giving. It calls up the body's strength and the mind's capacity it stretches the soul with listening to those the dream threatens, daring to ask them and others for help. Dream workers lie awake with doubt and sit still when set back. They go on again, more clear-eyed, their love refined by the one undying love that animates all things. Through such as these, the wild, not impossible hope deep within each of us is born again and again into the world. Love takes flesh 
and makes all things new. Thank you for the opportunity, Rita. That's wonderful. Beautiful. Beautiful. We have yeah. people in the chat. I don't know how many of you have tears in your eyes, but I do. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Mm. Wow. Hard to follow that up. <laughs> yeah. uh, hard to even know what to say when you think about really what's happening in the world. And, you know, I, I, I'm listening to your perspective. I don't, I don't think about all the time, you know, these animals that are just literally gone now. They're just gone. They used to be here and they're not. And this, we're not talking about dinosaurs. We're talking about our lifetime. And, you know, when people think extinction, they think it happened like a bazillion years ago when it's happening now, like now. And there's stuff we can do. You know, one of the things about this virus that I've always said is that the earth needed to breathe. She needed to breathe. And and like we can come out of this better. We can do better. We can come out of this. We can emerge with that spark that ignites real change. We can come out of this with a whole different perspective on how to treat and treasure the earth and each other. And, you know, your wild hope just shows that that's possible. Yes, thank you. Um, there were days when I just did a lot of crying because I didn't think it possible as I was researching and writing the other 24 stories in the book, which are about species that are hanging by a thread, many of them. Thread knot, for example, a little bird that you will see through your part of the world in New York as it migrates up to Canada to do its nesting in June. We've lost 75% of them in my lifetime. Uh, and the numbers are down again this year, I'm sorry to say. Um, so there is hope, and there's hope because so many people are devoted with great love to these creatures, but it's going to take all of us um, making big changes in our lives. Well, you had a beautiful chapter on the monarch butterfly, which is- Yes, yes. One of the things that I, one of the things I do is when the monarch comes back and comes to Montclair, New Jersey, I go out to look for the eggs under the milkweed leaves in my yard and I raised a lot of them, but they've been 90% down over the last six years. Yes. Last year was a somewhat better year, but then they had a hard winter. So you're never sure what's going to happen. When, it, when the populations get too low, it's very hard. And there's many, many reasons for it, but that's one of the things I think that a lot of people can be attentive to because they know the monarch yes. and they can see it and they can often find the egg and, and do something to raise it and uh, do it carefully. Yeah, we have people in the chat just saying, thank you so much for that moving reading. They, they loved your story. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have a question for Gail. What, what kinds of things can we do as individuals to help. Uh, Trina was talking about the monarchs and, and we've gotten eggs uh, when my sons were small, had them in our living room hatching. Um, and even as adults, we've had them. Uh, but what, 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 what things can we do to help the situation for the animals that we share this earth with? Because we're all here together, as everybody keeps saying now, but the, the we is not just us uh, two-legged creatures. Yeah. Well, the answers to that, Denise, are complex, as you might imagine. And they're big and small. Like climate change, for example, influences nearly all the animals in the book. So as we work to cut our emissions by doing everything from changing our diets to changing the way we do transportation, to uh, changing the ways we heat our homes, all those things, as they affect climate change, will make life for species, nearly all of them, uh, more possible. And then they're doing the small things like planting milkweed, uh, learn, uh, eschewing products with palm oil because the encroachment of palm oil forests across the rainforests, uh, palm oil plantations across the rainforests in Indonesia are wiping out orangutan. 
So it's small things like planting milkweed and eliminating palm oil from our diets and our personal care products to big things like affecting, uh, doing what we can as individuals and as communities to um, take down our carbon emissions. Mm. Yeah, it, it runs the gamut, in other words, I guess that's what I'm saying, from very yeah. small to very large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It certainly sounds like a time of focusing on uh, local, because the transportation across the world that we have come to expect, and globalization means that, but does it and should it? Because that's a very, very impossible thing from so many points of view, because that means a lot of places will not be able to be sustainable within their own countries, which is the case we have now. And it's such a mistake because we've had such a global economy set up that Princess Haiti is expected to raise sugar. Yeah. So they're not able to then do their, their other sustainable farming. And also with manufacturing, I think we see today with the lack of masks and testing kits and all the things that uh, it, it's very difficult to, uh, to mm -hmm. consider how, how, how those things affect everything. Yeah. So true, so true. And we could talk about this forever because there's so much we can dive into. And we only have a little bit of time. And Denise, I can't wait to hear from you. So I'm going to pass it your way. Okay. Um, as Trina mentioned earlier, um, I write for for kids of, of all ages and young people. And when we were talking about um, hope in a time of crisis, and then that's what tonight would focus on, I thought uh, what I would like to share is a book that I wrote a couple of years ago that takes place in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, which was another time and situation when a large community was in crisis. Uh, and Katrina didn't just affect New Orleans, but that was the, the largest uh, place. And I was thinking about how, because I am from Louisiana, I had family involved there, how to look at what happens to a family, what happens to young people uh, when you have to go through something like this, and how do you handle it and what happens afterward. So finding some places is, is it focuses on a girl who would have turned 13 on the day that the hurricane actually strikes. Um, and I have, this is, oops, it's it's backwards, but it's finding, yeah, you can no, see it. No, finding some places, it's backwards to me, but not to you. Um, and so I wanna read a, a, a portion of a chapter. And just a brief setup is uh, Reese is the main character, Teresa Boone, uh, who's 13. As it happens, when everything goes down, she's separated from her parents. Her father's a police officer who goes to work the day before this happens. Her mother is a nurse, registered nurse, who goes to work. And when everything happens and the order is given to evacuate the city, they, because of what they do as essential workers, we've heard this so much now, um, are at their jobs. And so Reese ends up spending, in during the hurricane with one of the neighbors um, and they get evacuated. Their house, they have to leave. And she and her mother, the family is separated because the father is still working, uh, but the mother is so upset after uh, kind of having to find Reese, look for her, um, that they come to New Jersey where the mother's originally from as evacuees. When Katrina actually happened, I was living here and I met many people in our town who were from New Orleans, who were here for varying periods of time because their homes were destroyed or um, they were not able to occupy them. So this chapter is, uh, takes place in the spring. Katrina happened in August. Reese's first time going back to New Orleans is in April uh, of 2006. So it's months later. Uh, she has not seen home or anything. Um, so she and her mother are on the plane. 
Reese had never liked airplane takeoffs or landings. She closed her eyes, gripped the armrests, and pressed herself back against the seat, waiting for that odd sensation of lifting off into the air. This time, both her stomach and her knees were shaky, and she wasn't sure that flying again was the reason. Are you all right? Her mother whispered from the next seat. I don't know, Reese said, looking out of the window instead of at her mother. The plane was still climbing, but the winding ribbons of New Jersey highways were hardly visible anymore through the wispy clouds. In a few hours, they'd land in Baton Rouge to spend the night. Tomorrow, they'd drive into New Orleans. I'm not sure either, Mom said. She took off her reading glasses and dropped them onto the stack of folders in her lap. You know, she said, when my parents died in that car accident, I was afraid nothing would ever feel normal again. Nothing would ever be normal again. Reese wondered what made her mother bring that awful subject up. Aunt Tish had been only seven or eight, her mother 13. They were visiting an aunt and their parents were coming to pick them up. It was the visit that never ended. In Miss Martine's attic, I thought some crazy stuff, Reese said. I wondered how anybody could go on as if they lost everything. Mom nodded. And I just realized, Reese said, you did that, Mom. You went through something huge, something tragic. Reese lowered her voice. It's like, like walking through the world when nothing is real but you, right? Right. Mom played with her heart necklace. Then she said, but I put one foot in front of the other and made it to nursing school in New Orleans and met your dad. She laughed a little. He made things real, all right. We got married, had Junior, had you. I woke up one day and looked around and said to myself, this is normal. That's what new normal means, Reese said. I get it. Mom tilted her head and looked at Reese hard. But deep down, I lived every day afraid that I would lose everything again. Reese had never known her mother to be timid or to shy away from anything. She was a surgical nurse. Mom, you thought you wouldn't find me, didn't you? Her mother took a deep breath. When I heard about the flooding and the levees breaking, I lost it. I couldn't find my husband. I didn't know what happened to my daughter. We had coworkers who disappeared. Every hour I got madder, mad at New Orleans and at your father for making me love it so much. Wow. Reese had to take a minute to wrap her head around this conversation. This wasn't kid stuff. But then she hadn't felt like a kid for the last eight months. Inside her, there had been an almost constant tug of war between hope and fear about going back. Reese hoped she might one day be as strong as Jeannie Boone, her mother. She turned to the window again. Now the plane was cruising along a thick white carpet of clouds, and as far as she could see, the sky was a bright and perfect blue. But life's not perfect, she thought. She put her headphones on and zoned out for the rest of the flight. So the book is called Finding Someplace. And the title actually came from a poem that I wrote long before I wrote this book. Um, and Reese finds this poem at the house of the older lady she is uh, stuck with during the hurricane. And during everything, the woman gives her a copy of the book, but she loses it. So near the end, Reese's aunt has tracked it down, found a copy of the book and given it to her. And she gets to read the poem again. And this is in the last chapter of the book. And the poem is called Finding Someplace. The mat says welcome, but my heart reads, enter here and be loved. And yes, there's always another dream to chase or friend to follow, always one more photo to take 
before returning, before embracing the old life that's fading in the brightness of now. But let me tell you, find some place. Get yourself somewhere that you always enter, knowing that you will be loved. And that is the focus of all of my work for children, uh, especially, but for anyone. Um, I believe very deeply that every child who comes into the world deserves to be loved. And that is where I come from when I write stories about families, uh, about children, um, even about adults who used to be children. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is what we deserve. That is what we look for consciously or unconsciously in, in our lives. And the hope that we have is, is, is really based on that hope to find our someplace where we feel right and we feel um, that we are knowing, self-knowing, as we talked about earlier, and, and we feel love and we feel free to give love as well. So that's just uh, one of the things that I've done. And I, I continue to write from that uh, point of view that there is hope to be loved and, and particularly for children that is the environment we should be creating for them. That's beautiful. Denise, one thing that you said when you read, that there was a, a sentence that really struck me. It says, a walking in the world where nothing is real but you. Mm. Like, isn't that what we're all feeling right now? Yes. I mean, yeah. I see a picture yeah. of Times Square and you yes. could close your eyes and walk across the street without a care in the world yes. is like, how can this be real? How can the world we're living in right now, how, how can this be reality? And so that that sentence really like struck that I know that so many of us feel that way. I, I think that that, I think that is so true when we experience um, individual crises in our lives, you know, whatever the, whatever the, the issue may be that, so often what we feel at the beginning, what we may feel for a long time is that nobody can feel this way. Nobody has ever felt this way. I am the only person, even if you're sharing this experience with someone else or other people. And, and it does take time for us to realize we are not walking alone in the world through any of these experiences as, as humanity everything has been experienced before, really. And, and I guess for us now who thing, we've discovered everything, we can do anything, but the way we as humans feel and move and live in the world has, has been experienced already. And we just don't yeah. um, take the time to stop and, and think about that. And, and that's in terms of living with other creatures as well. We've, we've been here all together all this time. So we've, we've experienced these things um, and it, we need to remember, yeah, we are not walking through the world as lonely. Yeah. We're here with, with everybody else. Yeah. Especially now, it's so clear. And many yeah. of us are in our homes with everybody else now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On a slightly uh, less uh, profound uh, level, I was just impressed by your ability to have a turn of phrase. You just seem to be able to find the right words. And what I wrote down was, uh, and I, I hope this is uh, verbatim, mad at your father for making me love it so much. Mm -hmm. Oops, I'm rolling in my chair. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it, like I said, I, I do like to write about families and, and family relationships and how uh, people communicate with each other um, multi-generationally most of the time, uh, because that's the way I grew up too. And I think it, it is important for us, uh, whether they're in our families or not, to have multi-generational relationships. So, you know, that deepens our experiences and, and back to that self-knowledge thing again. 
it helps us to understand who we are when we know people who have had different experiences. So. Hear, hear. Yeah. I remember so well when Denise was at church with her children or younger. And they, yeah. they had four, four sons. And there's Denise. And they were boom, 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 boom. Just a, a kind of little. That stair step thing only lasted for a few years. And then <laughs> suddenly I was the shrimp. <laughs> And uh, even if I wore heels trying to dress nicely to go to church, um, they were all taller than I. And it turned out they are. So, yeah, I'm the short person now. <laughs> I don't know what our time still is, but I just feel that there's not much for me to say today because we have such. Well, I, I do have a question for Gail. Um does Gail know the organization and website OMG One More Generation, led by children who want to stop the extinction of animals and habitat? I don't know it, but I'm going to look it up. Yes, it's called One More Generation. So thank you so much. I'm sure that that's a wonderful connection. So yeah. and I will throw in there, Mari, song that um, a number of the stories in the book are about the actions of children to help save species. I'm convinced that children are leading the way in this oh, yes. passion. And um, so I'm, I'm delighted to know about it. And um, I'm delighted, I've been surprised because I thought the, I wrote the book for adults, but I've had a number of letters and emails from people who have read it as families and children have warmed to it in a way that I didn't expect. And I'm, I'm delighted about that because as I say, I think they're the leaders of this contagion of compassion for species. Well, it sounds like you definitely should be in touch with one more generation. What a beautiful phrase, Gail. Mm -hmm. uh, compassion, what is that phrase you use? Oh, I said, I, I think there is, uh, when sometimes when I give talks, I'll say, you know, it's true, the Taki has come back, the bald eagle has come back, the peregrine falcon, but it's true that we've lost throngs of species that we'll never see in the same numbers. It's different from my grandparents, when my grandparents were young, when there were throngs of orangutans and leopards roaming the planet. But what I think is different from when my grandparents were young, from even when I was young, which wasn't that long ago, is that there's this contagion of compassion sweeping the globe for wild creatures. There's so much more interest in wild animals and the way they live and uh, their, the fascination of them, the ways they're like us. We were talking earlier today about how we can, uh, Denise and I, about how we can really feel what mothering is like for these creatures because we've been mothers ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a contagion of compassion. Our prayer is that it sweeps the globe quickly enough to save these species. I, I wonder. I wonder if that compassion uh, exists. That kind of compassion exists now. <clears throat> because so many people no longer live in concert with um, the with animals in their natural habitats, so, you know, you're you're urban or suburban or um, yeah. away from um, the land and nature in the way a generation or two two three generations ago people lived more in concert um, uh, and respect. Yeah. with uh, other creatures um and now you know most kids don't have that experience and right I, I think it's intention i mean um there were some peoples who had more respect and awe than even we do for these creatures because they live very close to them yeah and then as we started encroaching on their habitat i think then we became we saw them as competitors mm -hmm. so then we had, there was more of an animosity that developed as long as there was enough space for all yeah. then the, the respect and the awe could um could surge yeah. but when we began encroaching on their habitats then they became competitors and we began wanting to wipe them out because those black-footed ferrets and those prairie dogs and other animal in the book were taking the land that we wanted to grow wheat on thank you very much yeah and so we, we do have to find a balance. Um, for example, for Africans who are trying to herd animals on elephant grasslands, we've got to find a way for elephants and the herding peoples to live together. Yeah. And there are many fine organizations out there who are doing that. 
but but it's a tension. I, I don't mean to make it simplistic and nostalgic. Yeah, no, I, it is so true. Now we've already passed the top of the hour and I just wanna say that this has been such a wonderful evening. Thank you all in the chat and who have joined us for this live event. Thank you so much for being here. Trina, I'm gonna pass it over to you for some closing comments. Scott, did you wanna say anything before we go over to Trina? Well, Again, thank you so much. And Gail and Denise, you were wonderful, wonderful guests. We appreciate you so much for taking your time to share with us here tonight. Thank you. Yes, Denise and Gail, thank you so much. It was I, I'm looking forward to uh, watching the replay of this because there's just so many wonderful things that were said. I'm sure a lot of it just kind of brushed by me. So thank you so for joining us on day number two of Seven Days of Hope. Trina? Thank you for your immense inspiration. And I'm ho I think that we're going to be having anything you want to say about how you can be contacted or the nature of your books. We'll have that somehow on the chat or on something at the end of this, or in some way to get it out as we edit the replay of this. Because uh, I think I think people are going to want to look up your books, Denise Patrick and Gail, G-A-Y-L-E, Boss, B-O-S-S. -S. And so I'm just so honored that you chose to join us. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And that all of you in that chat room chose to join us. And all of you watching on YouTube joined Choose to, chose to join us. It's really such a privilege. And it's a we that put this on. It's a we of this terrific little team that I'm part of. What a privilege it, it is. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Okay. <laughs>